Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm so thrilled to see so many of you joining us tonight. Um, thank you so much for your time this evening on this really, really important webinar. Um, just really thrilled to have everyone here. So thank you very much. My name is Cassie Chambers. I'm the Operations Director at the South African Depression and Anxiety Group. And this evening, we're really thrilled to be having you here in this very safe space as we talk about an important topic. We've seen lots of people talking about it and in the press and media over the last couple of months. But now more than ever, it's really important that we get to talk about mental health, um, especially amongst our medical students and learning different ways, uh, tips and tools of how to cope with burnout, anxiety, stress, distress, which all of us can relate to either in ourselves or someone in our life as well. So thank you everyone just again for, for joining us. Um, we, we really, really appreciate it. Um, I know I don't wanna use up too much of your time um, and just some, some basic house rules as we do for our Zoom webinars, just to help us have that great experience together tonight, because this is a safe space where we get to comment and talk and ask questions and really just unpack um, the, the issues around mental health and how it affects medical students. Um, this evening, you're welcome to keep your cameras off and please stay muted so that our speakers um, don't have any disruptions. But more importantly, towards the end, we are going to have a panel discussion where we really want to interact. We want to meet you online. Um, so if your network allows and if you don't have load shedding, it'd be really great if you want to at the end put your cameras on, unmute, raise your hand for a question. It'd be really great to, to interact um, this evening. And, and thanks for those that are introducing themselves in the chat box. You know, in our crazy Zoom world where everything is online, it's just really, really helpful to connect. And I'd really encourage you to tell us who you are, where you're joining us from tonight. Um, it's really nice to connect and see where everyone is. And we are doing a recording of the evening tonight. There are some students who weren't able to join and we will be sharing the recording with them because we think it's incredibly invaluable. Um, so thanks again for that. Um, I just wanted to start off for two minutes just to share a little bit about kind of why SADAG here and how we connected to this and why medical students and, you know, so the South African Depression Anxiety Group have been running for over 27 years. And a couple of years ago, we were seeing a huge spike in the number of calls that we were receiving to our helplines from medical students. And we were very concerned and, and we spoke and reached out to our partners, specifically Discovery, um, who came on board and, and, and we had these discussions about how do we better support our medical students in South Africa. They're such a, a prized group in the sense that we need to do whatever we can to make sure that we look after their mental health and that we ensure that they do get to complete their studies and go on to help more people but feel like they're mentally well and strong enough and supported during that journey. You know, all too often we were seeing too much press um, of a medical student who had taken their life and, and committed suicide and made the press headlines. And that was a huge loss to us. And that's why it was really important for us as SADAG in partnership with Discovery Health to launch a dedicated helpline for medical students. So we have a toll-free helpline um, that provides free telephone counseling to any medical student throughout the country it is also open to junior doctors and young doctors, those that are doing internship or commserve, providing free help 24 hours a day. So at any moment when you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed or need to vent or had a really tough day or traumatic day, and you just need to speak to someone in a safe space, you can be anonymous and you can pick up the phone and speak to a counselor at SADAG. What we're able to do then is also provide you with resources organized pro bono therapy sessions, uh, group debriefing. Um, and that's been really, really useful for a lot of groups throughout South Africa that we've been able to connect with. And that's why we're really honored to be in this platform tonight, to be able to provide a safe space to talk about these issues that often there's so much stigma, um, so much fear of talking about mental health issues, especially amongst medical students where, you know, we talking about emotional things, talking about mental health makes us seen as less than or weak. And we're actually wanting to create that safe space that it's not 
a weakness um, and that there is help and support for all of you. Um, this evening as well, we just wanted to share some of the details as to what are we seeing on the lines, which is really useful for you as a medical student or as a colleague or a peer, but also what to look out for in your friends. Um, what kind of questions to ask? How do we have these conversations? And what has been some of the experience? And that's why I'm really thrilled in our lineup of speakers tonight, um, who will be helping us to unpack some of these uh, important conversations and, and topics. When we look at the kinds of issues that we see at the Medical Students Helpline um, and how we can help people going forward and how do we identify this, you know, over the last couple of months, especially during COVID, We've been monitoring the stats and figures really, really closely. And we're seeing, for example, that we have more female callers than male callers um, just in the space of six months. And, and you can see from January to June, we have over 1,300 calls from people reaching out to the helplines, which I'm encouraged about. Um, and, and accessing those resources is, is really important. And creating awareness like we can tonight just lets everyone know that there is help available. Um, some of the help that you can get through the Discovery Medical Students and Young Doctors Helpline is free counseling, crisis intervention, trauma debriefing, referrals to resources either private, on campus or free. You know, one of the, the issues that we're very aware of um, is medical students not wanting or feeling stigmatized or, or not wanting to access treatment on campus or in their hospital or in their clinics because you're dealing with peers and people around you. Um, so we're able to find confidential, anonymous counseling for you if you're needed off site a bit further away or even online during COVID. Whatever we can to provide that support to you is incredibly critical and we're able to do that. Some of the types of calls that we see and, and again, this is so that we can think throughout the session tonight, how relevant is this to me? Have I felt like this at, at some point in the last week, the last month, the last year, the last five years? Um, or do I know someone who maybe has some of these red flags? And tonight is your opportunity to ask, how do we actually then, how do we start that conversation? How do we get them help? So a lot of our callers that do call in often feel overwhelmed, stressed, depression, anxiety, thoughts of suicide, um, or even previous attempts of suicide. There's issues of privacy, and there's a lot of fear and shame about accessing help. And that's what we're hoping tonight we can break down some of those barriers. Financial issues, family pressures, lack of support, academic pressure and stress, relationship issues, substance abuse as a coping mechanism. And these are just some of the issues that we're seeing people calling in for help. You know, especially now with COVID, there's been all these extra stresses. Um, I know as well with your unique group, you've had a lot of changes in a very short space of time, a lot of extra pressure. And that's why this talk tonight is so, so important. And we're hoping that it's one of many, that we don't stop the conversation just after tonight. And I think, you know, without further ado, I think it's perfect timing um, to introduce you to our first speaker tonight. Dr. Alicia Porter, who's a psychiatrist and also one of the national coordinators for the Healthcare Workers Care Network, which is an initiative that we launched last year during COVID that provides free mental health resources to all frontline healthcare workers in South Africa. Um, and she's gonna be talking a little bit, just setting the scene about the mental health issues amongst medical students um, and, and some of the signs and symptoms and what to do. So thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Alicia, over to you. Thank you, Cassie. Um, it really is lovely to be here this evening. I often think I wish I had this when I was a medical student, and I'm so glad that we're starting the conversations. And so I'll really encourage you this evening to come and be a part of this conversation. It is a safe space. And so without further ado, I'm just going to share my screen so we can get right to it. Okay. So I think maybe to start off with, let's just talk about stress and what stress and what stress is. 
Now, we have to appreciate that you do get good stress and bad stress. And 20 years ago, when I was at medical school, it was probably the most stressful time in my life. And really, medical school is stressful for many students. I could even say for most or all students. So it is very important that we monitor our stress levels and we also monitor our patterns of stress wisely. And I don't think that we actually are sort of attuned to doing that. We kind of just go, 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 do, 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 do. And so stress is really basic to our everyday survival. But because if you think about it, if we didn't stress, we may not study, we may not do well in exams. So it is sort of basic to our everyday survival. And our response helps us to prepare and also to face challenges. So not all stress is bad stress. We do talk about something called stress um, resilience. So, you know, we shouldn't be afraid of stress because it's very unrealistic to expect that we'll go through life without any stress at all. It's about how we manage our stress. So stress is a demand on one or more of our body's physiological systems. Um, it's our, our body has a host of stress response capabilities which keep us in equilibrium. And this is talking about if we go back to our anatomy, we're looking at our sympathetic and our parasympathetic nervous system. And our body is actually built to kind of keep these systems in equilibrium. You know, our sympathetic nervous system is the flight, fright or freeze. And then your autonomic system is that system that kind of numbs, relaxes, and brings more of a balance. So it's important that we kind of realize that when we're stressing, you know, which system are we actually um, feeding and how do we regulate the system? It's also important just to keep a close eye of what pattern of stress you're experiencing and keep it in equilibrium. During medical school and most especially during the time of the pandemic, and it's important that we recognize what our levels of stress are and that we respond appropriately. And like I said, I don't think that we kind of are taught to do this. We kind of just go and continue being on autopilot. So when stress is unpredictable, when it's severe, when it's uncontrolled, it definitely leads to a greater vulnerability to the effects of stress. But if it's predictable, moderate, if it's controlled, managing stress in this way definitely increases our resilience. So, for example, if we have a daily structure, we have regular meal times, we limit social media, we sort of have some form of movement during our day, if we reach out to friends, family, um, fellow students, if we kind of help each other, we take particular note with regards to our sleep. I know most medical students and even for myself, when you're at medical school, sleep and sleep hygiene is not something that we take too seriously, but sleep is really important in kind of how we manage our stress. And so this will definitely lead to more in the way of resilience. But if we have minimal structure, minimal exercise, sleep disruptions, we comfort eat too much media, we definitely are then more um, become more vulnerable to the effects of stress. Now you can imagine on a day-to-day -day basis, if you if we begin to kind of get used to or attuned to monitoring what our stress is, like for example, for myself, I'll kind of stop and ask myself, okay, which system is now being activated? Is it my sympathetic nervous system or my parasympathetic nervous system? Remember our bodies are amazing in keeping these things in balance. So if I have stress and if I kind of monitor it throughout the day and I do just like an activity that might bring the stress down, it will then lead to a bit of equilibrium being formed. The stress might build up again, but if I then take, and we call these micro moments. So for example, just something like 60 seconds or a minute of breathing might be able to regulate your, your nervous system. So there's science even behind being mindful. So if you add a micro moment, you'll get this curve where the stress is then more manageable as opposed to having this constant escalating um, stress. So you can imagine that by the end of the day, if we don't take these micro moments or be mindful of these micro moments, and they're not going to take hours, you know, we have a, what we call a 30 
three thirty approach, where if you have 30 seconds, there's some activities you can do, like, for example, breathing. If you've got um, three minutes, you could maybe make a phone call. And if you've got 30 minutes, you can do something that is, you know, longer in order to regulate this, this system. So it's about pausing to self-regulate. And some of the protective factors that increase our capacity to regulate would be sufficient sleep, just staying hydrated, um, eating regular meals, social connection. I mean, I remember being a student and an intern where we kind of like this idea that we never had lunch and we didn't actually even take a, um, a toilet break. We kind of wore it like a badge of honor. It actually really doesn't do much in terms of helping us to regulate or even managing stress. And it also actually may contribute then to this escalating level of stress that we might be experiencing. And like I explained with our autonomic nervous system, with your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system, we want to try to keep it in balance. And so, you know, we can then use tools which don't cost much because even just sitting in your chair, for example, in a lecture, you could actually do a micro recharge um, moment. So just some examples like when you wash your hands, because now we're doing that a lot more um, regularly, you can do it mindfully, you can do it slowly, you can take breaths. When you're walking upstairs, you can also do that more mindfully where you count stairs, you walk slower, you can do breathing exercises or even just connecting with others, like I mentioned, um, increasing our social um, connection at opportunities and also just being compassionate with yourself. I often say, you know, the things that you say to your friends the kind things that you say to your friends, um, you know, those are the same things that you should be telling yourself. Like there's some things that we often tell ourselves that we would never dare tell our friends. So it's just learning to be kinder and more compassionate to ourselves and just appreciating that we're doing the best that you can. Um, you know, for some of us, it may be, you know, spiritual verses, songs, music, positive affirmations, and even the, the Headspace app. And just, you know, remembering sometimes just to breathe. There really is great value in just breathing. So we're going to look at some of the manifestations of student distress. So what does distress look like? What are the what is the impact of that on particularly um, our mental health? It definitely increases the rates of depression, anxiety, stress, and and burnout. And you know there are consequences um, of this distress because the more distress um, you are, it definitely leads to um, difficulties in your academic performance, leads to cynicism, sometimes academic dishonesty, substance abuse, and, you know, suicide can also be a consequence um, of the stress that is often experienced by um, medical students. And I don't think it's changed in as many years as medical school has been around. I think these are the things that cause distress and also the consequences of distress. And, you know, unfortunately, life is not such that when you go to medical school, you can just put things on pause and then, you know, you live in a bubble for the years that you study. Unfortunately, life goes on and we can't compartmentalize the things that happen to us. You know, so some things, you know, there are personal factors that may increase the level of um, distress. Um, and they also might just be factors related to medical training, like personal factors like life events, um, birth, death, um, personality, coping strategies, um, personal responsibilities. And I mean, I, I can also imagine, you know, in terms of having to study away from home, I think it's one thing studying away in a different province. I think it's a whole different ballgame when you're having to go and study in another country with the foreign language. You need to learn different rules and then having to learn, um, you know, medicine in Spanish and then coming back and having to learn that in, in English. You know, some it's personal responsibilities, just debt, your learning style and even just motivation. Some of the factors related to medical school training, it could be the workload, the curriculum. You know, as a medical student, you're not spared of um, exposure to patient death and suffering, student loan debt. Uh, death is a big thing. Um, the system of performance evaluation, you know, passing, failing, um, ethical conflicts, student abuse, um, you know, at the hands of um, seniors where there may be verbal or even emotional abuse, 
sometimes just the institutional culture and a hidden or informal curriculum as well. And some of the potential consequences of these on a personal level, you know, would be broken relationships, substance abuse, poor self-care, not taking, you know, lack of exercise, a poor diet, a decline in physical health, and even like we mentioned before, suicide. And some of the um, professional consequences, again, your academic performance, definitely becomes impaired. There may be a decline in empathy um, and it might influence even your speciality choices. And so, you know, it's not in compartments or pockets, it definitely, and we can't switch on or switch off. Um, you know, it's life happens and we have to continue going in spite of, of that. Also just adjusting, you know, some of the causes of the student distress you know, sometimes we just have it's just the adjustments um, to the medical school environment, you know, and even for you guys in particular, maybe just to think about some of your specific challenges, you know, in terms of the impact of entering a highly stressed program in your fifth and sixth year of study. I mean, I remember fifth and sixth year were possibly, you know, the most important and the most, um, you know, um, difficult years um, in medical school. And also just adapting to a demanding new learning environment. You are learning in one way. You know, I often will have um, students on, you know, during a tut where you know the Spanish word, for example, for a disorder, and there's difficulty in finding the English word. But I mean, that's an adjustment in its in its own, you know, and even just the, the culture shock um, because like I said, the terminology and the language changes. There also may be an increase in the scholastic workload and the need for academic performance. And also just attempting to master a large volume of information. You join peer groups of equal motivation and intelligence. And I think it can be very intimidating for young adults entering a new environment. I think for anybody entering a new environment, it's intimidating. There also may be exposure to ethical and moral conflicts, um, dealing with senior professionals. I know there was quite a lot of work done on exposing, you know, bullying um, in the medical profession, um, but some of the senior professionals may be burnt out and stressed themselves. They may be cynical. You also might be working in environments where there isn't adequate supervision, you're having to deal with acutely ill children and adults. There may be moral injury, interacting with dying patients, and just understanding the limitations of medical, medical science. You know, a physician once said to me, there's definitely a place where medicine can't go. So we do our best, but we also sometimes hope and pray for miracles. And students definitely report feeling awkward, sad, overwhelmed, apprehensive, vulnerable, angry, and often anxious. Those are not uncommon feelings. If I have to reflect back even on my own medical training, those are definitely not um, foreign feelings um, or feelings that are um, unusual. And then some of the other causes would be students' abuse, like the perception of being taken advantage of. Unfortunately, you know, interns are the bottom of the food chain and medical students are one below interns on, on the food chain. And sometimes, you know, you can be taken advantage of. There may be verbal abuse by seniors, colleagues, nurses. There may even be, you know, um, embarrassment and shame. There may be racial discrimination or even sexual harassment. And research actually shows that less than one third of medical students report abuse to faculty or medical school administrators often due to fear of reprisal or concern of potential repercussions on performance evaluations. So it really is a difficult position because of the power dynamic as well. And then of course, you know, personal life events, like I said, we don't live in a bubble when we go to, to medical school and these are some of the life events that may impact us. So just in closing, I just want to talk a little bit about burnout and what might it you know, what does burnout look like? Because that's, you know, the buzzword. Also, we're getting to the end of the year, it's December, we're tired, and there's a lot of um, burnout. And I think as a medical profession, we are more at risk for burnout than, 
than others. And so it starts with stress. So it's very important for us to actually recognize and manage the stress you know, at the beginning, because stress leads to exhaustion, which leads to, which can then lead to burnout and burnout can actually then lead to full blown depression. So it's very important to actually begin to manage from the very beginning so that we don't get this escalation from stress all the way then to, to depression. And as a health worker, our important relationship is definitely with ourselves, but also our colleagues, our patients, and our family members. And I was saying to a group of healthcare workers recently, by the fact that we chose medicine and the health sciences as a profession, we kind of play the same roles in our families where we are the fixers, you know, and there's, you know, for a lot of us, when we went to medical school, it was kind of like you were the first person in your family to go to medical school and do this thing. And so the whole hope of your family was kind of riding on your, on your shoulders. And so those are quite, you know, that's an important relationship and also a dynamic. So Maslick defined um, burnout as a syndrome of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization and reduced personal accomplishment that can occur among individuals who work with people in some capacity. Now, some of the, the signs of burnout, the exhaustion, it can either be physical and emotional exhaustion, just dreading work. You know, some people describe it as having to like peel yourself off the bed and then drag yourself to work. When you open your eyes, you think, oh, could this day really, is it really day? Um, there's a lack of awareness of cognitive and emotional changes. In terms of a loss of personal accomplishments, it could be a decrease in job satisfaction, a lack of joy and positive emotions related to work. Um, with the depersonalization, this is where there may be a lack of um, patience, um, a deterioration in relationship. You may become disillusioned or even um, just cynical. And what does burnout sound like? You know, it's this on repeat, I can't take it anymore. I need a break. And this is repeated daily. I just can't face another patient. The workplace is awful and toxic. I'm done. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. You know, if those are some of the things that you might be saying, you may very well be um, burnt out or on the, the brink of, of burnout. And so I hope that this evening I've given an overview of what you know, stress and the importance of managing stress. It's not about avoiding stress, but it's about managing um, our stresses. What are some of the things that might cause distress for us as uh, medical students? And then just looking at burnout. So I'm gonna hand over back to Casey. Kathy, sorry. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Alicia. And I think that's really, really helpful to set the tone with some really practical tips and tools. And I think especially to pick up on those signs and symptoms um, and to see how it can actually escalate if we don't take it seriously and we don't get help. Um, so thank you very much for, for highlighting that. I think now what's, what's really important is being able to have a conversation as we've set the tone and we've spoken about this and really reintroduced these kinds of issues is to now, you know, have a, a discussion. And please, if you have any questions or queries, please now is the time to post in the chat box. We really love your comments um, or ideas or maybe burning questions that you'd like to ask. This is a safe space. Um, and we'd really love to, to encourage that. Um, this evening, I've got two amazing panelists who I've had the pleasure of sitting on many webinars and talks with in the past. Um, and I'm in, always in awe of, their insights, their compassion, and, and just their overall um, awareness around mental health and, and helping us to have this conversation. Um, so this evening, I'd like to just uh, welcome Dr. Lerata Katle, who is a medical doctor, a strategic stakeholder specialist, a clinician innovator, and a podcast host for Young MD, but I think also a critical thought leader in the space of medical students and young doctors around mental health. Um, so I welcome you this evening and thank you so, so much, Lorata. I really, really appreciate it. Our second panelist that we're going to invite um, is Dr. Pali, who is also a medical doctor and has, you know, a real special interest in mental health, who has own experience, worked with so many colleagues as well, and just been such an advocate for, for mental health and speaks from such a place of, of insight um, and knowing. 
but also as the chairperson of Jadasa. So I'm really encouraged to have you here as well. So evening and thank you. Um, so just a reminder to everyone, if you do have any questions, please post on the chat box. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, but Dr. Larock, I thought maybe I could just start off with you. Um, I know we've had many conversations around the experience of medical students and even the pressures of being a young doctor. Maybe you can start off with just sharing maybe some of your own experiences or the kinds of stresses that you saw when you were a medical student and how perhaps, you know, has it changed much? Um, I know we're in COVID, but if you can just share your experience. Thank you so much, Cassie, uh, to Dr. Porter for her presentation and just everybody who's made time this evening to be on the call. I think um, this is such valuable time. And I think similar to what Dr. Porter said, I wish when I was a medical student, I was more aware of these types of platforms and resources because it makes such a difference to be able to connect with community around issues that are so, so real to the everyday ex experience of a clinician, I think. and. Uh, thank you for your question. If I reflect on my journey, so I studied at Stellenbosch University during the years 2010 to 2015. Um, and I resonate deeply with a lot of what Dr. Porter shared around, you know, some of the internal things in my life that could have formed stresses, as well as the things around me in my institution and even amongst my peers that contributed to, to increased stress and probably declining mental health function during various periods of my medical career. Um, and I think I almost see it as like an onion. There's the core inner layer and that's yourself. And I think that's always the place to start, right? Is to get a sense of where you are personally in terms of your mental health. And I also just wanna say that it's not, it's not always intuitive to know, you know? I think often all of us take a really long personal journey to, to unpack how we navigate stress. For me in time, I learned that I was an emotional eater. I really just did run to food to try and get through any chronic uh, stress. And to give you an example, like I remember in my final year, I'd worked really hard to lose a lot of weight. Um, and then I realized that final exams were coming. And the decision I made was this simple. I literally decided I would rather be overweight with a degree because then I can afford a gym membership than try to figure out taking care of my mental health. That was literally the thought process. So I resonate very deeply with, um, you know, having to navigate those personal tensions and, and becoming more aware of what they look like for myself. And like, so in medical school was everything from having to write a test. In my context, it was having to navigate uh, a different language when, you know, lecturers were teaching and it was out of my control what language they chose when they were teaching. But I had to consume the information and understand it. Uh, everything from financial pressures and strain, you know, I, I didn't study on bursary, I took out financial loans, so every year counted. And even when I graduated, I had to make sure that I could graduate so I could pay off my student loans. Um, and then there was just, you know, things that happen in life in general, you know, you can't stop family being sick and you being far away. My family was in Johannesburg, so if anybody got sick and if, if anybody passed away, if there was a, actually a positive family milestone I couldn't attend those types of celebrations and those little things start to gnaw at your personal mental health. And then to speak of, you know, the outer layers of the onion, I, I was also exposed to some of the challenges that Dr. Porter spoke about, you know, they, there may be racial tensions that you're exposed to. Those are things that I definitely walked through at my institution. Um, also just things uh, around, you know, people's socioeconomic status. I didn't necessarily have all the means that other kids in school had, didn't have a car, uh, to go get my groceries, something that's very simple for something else. I need to think 10 steps around, you know, how do I get the food for this next week? Um, so it was those types of issues, but I think navigating it um, uh, around community was important. So having people around me who are navigating the same struggles, speaking to seniors as well, so that you don't feel like you're crazy when you see something um, or you notice a pattern that disturbs you. I think that also helped me maintain my sanity but then also getting involved in the leadership structures. I think personally, I had an interest in leadership, so I definitely invested in those roles. And that helped me also gain an understanding of the environment and the opportunities that were available to experience change. So sorry for a long-winded answer, uh, but that gives a sense of, of my journey. Um, and I also just wanted to add that I don't think that it's, it's unique to being in medical school. And I think this is why this talk is so important, is if you don't start to become aware of these issues or make yourself aware of what your patterns are in terms of your declining mental function, 
they're only gonna you're only gonna carry on experiencing them at higher degrees as you experience different life pressures um, and varying life stages so it's so important to use this time when you are a medical student when life's pressures are definitely there but they're not amplified to really learn about yourself and how you navigate these types of stresses because um yeah it, life will get more challenging but the more invested you are in trying to understand how you cope the better you'll become at coping in life oh and that's so so important and, and i really love the that kind of humanizing the medical student and the young doctor which i think has often created such a barrier to people opening up to talking to seeking help um and i think you know it's just so evident as well it is a long journey there's so many different layers um, and I kind of feel like that onion is really big with so many different layers. Um, so thank you so, so much for sharing that. Um, Dr. Tips, maybe I can come to you. You know, I know as well your experience in the last couple of years, you know, you've been working on the front lines, especially during COVID and, and maybe just to share like the kinds of stresses that you've dealt with or, or people around you. How has it been? So um, it's been quite multifaceted, for lack of a better word. Um, quite difficult to know where to start, but I'll start from, from at least the beginning of my, of my internship. Um, one of the, the, the biggest stressor from there was, you know, starting the, a new job for the first time and the responsibility that being a doctor weighs on you. I think most of us, you know, we, we do it every day. We kind of become so nonchalant about how much of a responsibility it is um, that we have in order to take care of so many people and their well-beings. And, you know, we, from that stage onwards, we, we already start to pick up unhealthy coping mechanisms um, as a result of that, because you start to realize that everything kind of falls on you, especially if you're working in an under-resourced environment. But fair enough, I got through that. You know, I had a good support system. My friends were there and, you know, they were there with me and we were there to help each other through it. Then what was a, a massive stressor for me was the loss of my grandmother, who was, you know, such a pivotal person in my, in my upbringing. You know, even through university, I felt that she carried me uh, emotionally through all the tough times in university. And her loss was, was quite profound on me. And it led me to quite a serious um, substance problem. And my, I, 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 turned, I turned to alcohol, um, I guess, functionally, but it was a problem nonetheless because you know that's how I felt that I could cope through the the feelings of grief that I was going through and you know and I'm sure a lot of a lot of uh, colleagues can kind of um, relate with that because a lot of us have this unhealthy relationship with alcohol and we we kind of turn to it to in order to numb the the pain that we're going through in order to to, to continue functioning in society um yeah it took me a while to get through that and i thought i had everything figured out um i thought my 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 career as a doctor was all set up i had everything planned everything was going well and then COVID happened <laughs> oh lord i learned so many new things about stress that i never thought i i would ever learn in terms of being a doctor Going back to the issue of responsibility um, that, that I had learned in internship and now kind of increased about 10, 15, 20 fold. Because as a doctor in, in COVID, especially early on, everything was facing you, you know, whether it's the patients you know, expecting you to, to help them or your, your colleagues, you know, the nursing staff, um, the other healthcare workers, you know, looking onto you to kind of carry this because everyone is kind of anxious about it and you have to you've been you've been kind of labeled as a hero in this pandemic and therefore you have to act like a hero and you know nothing <laughs> about being a hero but you know as 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 a person who's kind of been selected 
to 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 stand up against this COVID. You know, you take on the responsibility, and not nobody nobody has been has been in this situation. You can't look up to a senior and say, "Hey, okay, look, no, I I don't know how to handle this this situation. Um, can you help me?" You know, you look at your senior; they're breaking down. You're breaking down. Everyone's breaking down. People are breaking down because you're breaking down. Your patients are getting worse. There's more and more. And what was worse is that, what was bad for me is that you couldn't, you didn't have time to break down. You know, you didn't have time. You just had to keep going and going and going and going. And I mean, I've shared this before in previous webinars that I, 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 I really I really took this, this hero mantra on my shoulders because I, I, I felt that I had a responsibility on, on the community that I was treating you know, because um, not a lot of people well, I would say a lot of people are too scared to face this challenge, you know, and I kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and and I started saying some of the things that were quoted in Dr. Porter's um, talk, you know, and I thought to myself, you know, I, I know I've been burnt out before and I know, I know I'm burnt out, but, you know, I can't stop. Um, and I continued to push through that, and I got to a really, really dark place, a really dark place, and I, I, ironically, I was helped by being infected by COVID and having to spend 10, 10, 14 days, it was 14 days at that time, 14 days away from work, and, you know, from there, I actually came to a realization that actually my coping mechanisms are really bad, and they need to change. Um, now that that's that's on me. Now, in back back to 2018, in 2018, while I was a you know a first year intern trying trying to make it through life and having a basic understanding of the impact of mental health on 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 people in general, but doctors especially, um, you know, Professor Mayosi passed away. You know. And that started a huge conversation about mental health and doctors taking care of themselves. And that's where my interest kind of peaked in terms of, you know, encouraging um, healthcare workers to, to be in touch with their mental health and to find effective and healthy coping mechanisms in order to carry on and in order to put themselves first, in order to be able to treat the next person. Um, and from there, I mean, I decided to then kind of go into Judasa to kind of follow this passion and to try and encourage um, doctors to, to, to be in touch with their mental health. And I've been working with, with that and it's been a very special place. And we, we've, we've kind of tried ways to innovate and to be there for, for our colleagues and to, to, to make sure that they take mental health seriously because um, it's, um, unfortunately it is, it is looked down upon in, in our profession and it is associated with incompetence. And for me, that is not true. And, and I feel that our bad coping mechanisms started in university because you get kind of told that, you know, it's gonna be bad you know, you need to you need to toughen up. You need to grow a thick skin, and and once you do that, you're going to be a competent healthcare professional. Um, and therefore, once you you've been broken down like that, there's no way for you to come back. And I find that that's one of the biggest challenges that um, I, I I have to come across when I have to speak to my colleagues about you know, just call 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 go go to a psychologist or call SADAG or call healthcare. Workers Care Network, you know, you might feel like you're fine. Just call them. You'll feel better afterwards. And, you know, they'll say, no, no, I'm fine. I know I'm fine. And we, it's because we're in this cycle of, you know, I'm not allowed to show weakness. I'm not allowed to show weakness. I'm not allowed to show weakness. And one of my passions is, is to, you know, break that. We need to break that. We need to normalize talking. We need to normalize um, seeing the importance of, finding healthy coping mechanisms because we work in a very stressful environment and it's not going to change for a very long time. 
Absolutely. And I really love that talking about it, normalizing these conversations. And, you know, that's something that we've also seen at SADAG. And, and, and Dr. Lorato, I'd like to ask you about this is, you know, there's often this culture, this poor help seeking behavior, this culture, as mentioned of, you know, I'm, I'm too strong to ask for help. If I ask for help, it's a sign of weakness. Are we seeing enough of that culture changing? Um, and how do we help to change it even more going forward, especially when it's so important right now? Sure, I think my gut, my gut says no, absolutely not. We're not seeing enough of that changing yet, but I think the needle is moving. And I think it's moving slowly, just because now there are spaces where uh, these conversations can be had. Uh, for me, Cassie, there's nothing more affirming than hearing a consultant talk to me in a mentorship say, session saying, I'm really struggling with fatigue. Or I'm really struggling um, with having to wake up in the morning. I'm really not inspired anymore. It's making me very tired. And I think once one of my mentors says it's this way, doctors need to stop becoming gods, you know? When we remove ourselves from this pedestal and recognize that we are as human as the next person, then we can start to openly have conversations with full vulnerability, knowing that vulnerability is actually the, the one thing we have um, in common with all humans that keeps us connected, right? Um, so for me, I think it's hearing people speak very openly more, more often about the fact that these are the mistakes that happened in my journey. This is where I fell short. I don't want to see someone else doing the same things. And, and I think the help seeking behavior also has to start with self-awareness. Um, I think Dr. Tlale, Dr. Tlale alluded to it uh, when he was speaking to this idea of, you know, when we're in um, medical school, we're sort of encouraged to toughen up, you know, we, we, we learn how to put up a facade really quickly. So the moment when we need the help, it's like, oh, but like, when did you start needing the help? Um, so I think those are the, some of the complexities, but I think these conversational platforms are important. The self-awareness um, that we experience is also helping and something very, very like not in the realm of medicine, but I think that also alludes very highly to the Fact that people are always thinking about it is the meme culture that we have. There's always a meme every day or or phrases we use in our culture like beke le beke that alludes to the fact that people are actually struggling. So I think um, the, the reality is there's an outcry, uh, but the outcry has not yet transformed into actionable um, um, outcomes from a personal level where people are really encouraged to seek behave and I think seek help. And I think that's a really nuanced and complex thing from from every person's perspective everything from what you think it's going to mean religiously to what you believe it says of yourself to yourself before you can translate it to your environment into your context and particularly in medical school when you're very worried about you know just reaching the goal and the finish line it can sometimes feel like if you admit that you need help or if you admit that you need a break and you are burnt out you are then the very person who's standing in the way of your very goal. Uh, so I think we need to be empowered uh, to trust that there's no perfect process. And it's so much better to get to the end of a journey, complete, whole, wow, rather than just holding that piece of paper that's a degree. Um, in my personal life and in the work that I do with Young MD, I often think it's attributed to the fact that we haven't all agreed or been shown what an ideal doctor looks like. For all intents and purposes, the ideal doctor is just somebody who has the piece of paper, you're certified by the HPCSA, and you can do the job. But we need more. Our healthcare context need more, and we need more from ourselves. We need uh, to be a healthy person, somebody who can um, add value, not just at the bedside, but in every other life role you desire to assume or that you currently assume. But I think it's also about having the self-awareness to decide for yourself, what's a good finish line look like as myself? And if I need to take moments to, to invest in other areas of my life so that I can get there and that's strong, um, then that's, that's also perfect. And I think some of the, the stigma that exists around things like finishing in record time or having to repeat a year always also crushes you know, the emotional spirit of anybody who's a medical student. I mean, to get into med school, you worked really hard, you were the star student, you probably got all the bursaries that exist, and then you come face to face with a course that's just really challenging and very hard. And for many of the students on this call, you made a big sacrifice. You know, you went to an entire different country to go and pursue that dream, only to come home and to be faced with more challenges. 
so I think it's, it's really about sensitizing ourselves to the changing environment um, and agreeing on a different standard as to what it means to be a healthy doctor so that people are more, more encouraged to reach out because I think the resources are there. We know healthcare workers are there, there. We know uh, the Discovery Static Health Plan is there. Um, but what is it going to take for us to be encouraged to share that information for ourselves? But also, when I, I had the opportunity to go to the Oprah Winfrey um, uh, School, OLAG, and one of the systems that they have there that I thought was absolutely incredible and something that I think any medical environment needs is like a, a referral box. So if we also could leverage the resource of our peers and we could trust that when people say, I think you're in trouble, um, you need help. If somebody does it on your behalf sometimes, taking that first step um, is helpful for you to try and get the help that you need. So I'd like to see those types of, those you know anonymous boxes existing to say, I think X student who's my friend is in trouble and I'd like you know, a counselor to reach out to them because I think they're declining. So just strengthening the support so that even if you can't take that first step, somebody else who's aware of you, who trusts you, who you trust can help you initiate the help that you need. Mm. And that's, I think, really, really important. It leads also to the next question I'd like to ask you, Dr. Tepps, is we have a question, you know, there are so many who are not aware that they have a problem. Um, and especially, Larata, this, this ends off with, you know, how do you help a, a colleague or a friend? Um, how do we help someone realize that they may be one that needs help and encouraging them to seek help? Because often having that conversation is really difficult. Um, we don't want to say, hey, something's wrong. But how do we say that in a supportive way, especially to a fellow medical student or young doctor, how do we as a friend or a colleague reach out? What should what what, what are your tips? What what should we say? It's a, it's a very difficult question, but um, the most important thing is honesty and showing empathy. You know, um, when approaching a friend or colleague who is and wow, you know, you need to be patient with them and explain to them why you think ABC is happening and kind of give them options on how they can, you know, who they can approach and how, how they can deal with, with what they're going through. But, you know, uh, also, I mean, it goes back to the whole thing of, of normalizing. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how many stories I've heard of people who said, oh my gosh, I didn't know how much I needed therapy until I went. You know, we all think, we all think we're well um, until, until we realize that we're not. We're all harboring past traumas that we have not dealt with. And I, that, that, yeah, I go back to the whole thing of normalizing. And uh, one, one my, my dream once upon a time was to have mandatory uh, debriefing and counseling sessions for, for doctors, whether it's once or two times, once or twice a year. But just, just to have that and have that platform where you can talk and, and get things off your chest. And you know, that will kind of lead to a process where we also realize and, and learn where where we you know how we we are maybe struggling with our mental health. Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite a difficult question. There's no correct answer for, for, for all situations, but it, it just depends on who you're talking to and, and what situation they're in. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the best way, um, you know, being honest and having that conversation. There's no right or wrong way to say it, but it's about having that conversation. Um, and I think also just to encourage that maybe the first time that you start that conversation might not be the last time, you know, um, we've done so many different webinars. It's, it's talking and talking until someone listens. Um, and there might be different approaches. It might be different ways of saying it. It might be saying it more than once. But the fact is, is that you are showing up and saying, I care about you. And I'm really worried about you. I've noticed this. I want to help you to get that care. And I think um, we've also just posted in the chat box, there's some, some helpful resources. It's the numbers. It's the access that is available even through M M Mpule. Um, so please, you know, keep those numbers because you never know when you need to use them either for yourself or someone else in the field. Um, so absolutely, please, please keep them. 
I have another question and I'd like to open it up to the panel. You can tell me, you know, press the buzzer as to who wants to answer first and so no pressure. Um, we have a question here is how can one stay motivated and focused, especially during these difficult times? I learned that I get distracted so much and one way that I avoid stress is to stay away from the stressor. But now the stressor is a module I need to face in order to pass. What ends up happening is lack of performance. What do, what would you suggest? Okay, I'll, I'll go first. <laughs> um, it's very, it's very important to strike a balance for me when in a very stressful situation, you, you need to strike a balance. And the balance needs to include um, making progress and finding time for yourself. You know, the, usually what happens is that we spend so much time and effort trying to make progress and we don't make time for ourselves and we end up being in a, quite a, a difficult situation mentally. Um, and that often leads to problems. And I find that it, it is important to find that balance to say, okay, cool, I need to reach this goal and I, I need to record how what kind of progress I'm making. But at the same time, I need to make time for me because if I'm not okay, I won't be able to achieve that. And making time for yourself can come in different ways, you know, exercise, you know, having a good uh, social support system, doing, you know, investing time in hobbies. Those things might seem small and insignificant at the time, but you will realize at the end how much they actually helped you. And that's my piece. Thank you, Dr. Lorato. I completely agree with Dr. Tladi. Also, just want to send a disclaimer. I'm due to be loaded. I'm set up for if anything happens. So please don't be alarmed. I really hope I don't cut off. Um, but I just wanted to, to echo um, Dr. Tladi's response. I think he's absolutely right in terms of, you know, helping you identify that there's a, an objective to reach, but you need to manage yourself. And I think I want to really sit more on that manage yourself part because I think to me, these things weren't always obvious, you know, studying to pass the test, very obvious. You need to open the book and read, you know, apply them to chair. But then managing yourself is actually quite a nuanced thing and something that all of us need to take a journey to understand how to do. Ooh, I'm still here. Yeah, we made it. <laughs> I'm just going to switch my camera um, off just because you're going to see the glare of my glasses if you don't mind. Um, mm -hmm. but, but essentially, I think for me, that, that personal aspect is becomes the most important part. And so I'm the host of the Becoming Healers podcast, and we actually spent an entire season focusing on emotion words, because I think I often found in my own personal journey that the tension is actually trying to name what you are feeling. So you've noticed that you're avoiding studying, but what is the feeling that's driving that avoidance? Is it fear? Is it anxiety? And then questioning, you know, that emotion, why are you afraid? Are you afraid that you're going to fail? Are you afraid that um, the workload is too overwhelming? Are you afraid because you feel like you can study better under pressure, but you're not good at making a plan? Are you afraid because you don't trust the plans that you make around studying? Those are all such important questions to be able to help yourself demystify the problem. Because in your mind now, it's huge and it's in, in, insurmountable and you can't climb that mountain. But if you deconstruct it piece by piece, you'll get to the place where you recognize, okay, maybe my fear here is irrational. And actually, because I've been studying for five years in medical school, I have been able to learn strategies and approaches to pass a test. Then the second thing I would say is also reach out. If you do feel like, um, you know, this block or this, this term is really overwhelming, or it's triggering some things that remind me of personal experiences um, that, that are difficult, call on your friends to help. In my final year, I never had, you know, reams and reams of notes that I made for myself. I really leveraged the resource of my peers. I asked people, do you have a good summary for cardio? Because I don't think I summarized that well. Um, we had a, a few colleagues who enjoyed writing summaries, so we asked them to assist us. So I think it's really about also making sure that you don't get stuck in your head. Deconstruct those questions and fears. Try to dig into the root emotion that's driving this this, this is this incessant need to re remove yourself from the stressor um, and recognize that you have everything that you need internally as well to be able to conquer those fears, but then also reach out externally. A lot of what we're speaking about tonight is really addressing the, the coping mechanisms that you need. 
And if you find that you get to a roadblock and you realize, actually, I don't have the coping mechanisms to navigate some of these emotional challenges I'm facing, reach out for help and support. You don't want to get to the end of the block and, and have lost out on what you really wanted to achieve, which is really passing, when really the journey was probably very conversational and questioning the story you're telling yourself about this block. I also want to mention for medical students in particular, have your own journey. I remember so clearly when I was a medical student, people always told me that final year was going to be the worst year of my life, particularly in Stellenbosch because we wrote like our exams in, in like it was like a hell week, for lack of a better term. We wrote all seven exams. There was barely any sleeping. And people just painted this picture that it was traumatic. And if you ever come out of it alive, you know, you really were like some hero. Have your own experience in medical school. Take, yes, the 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 lessons that people have to share but don't hype yourself up about the negative connotations that people have about medical schools learning um certain lecturers believe in yourself like bet on you bet on the fact that you can do something you can do it well and and prove yourself wrong so i think just to echo um some of the things that's uh, Dr. Pladi said, but also to encourage you to really dig into what are those root emotions that are helping you re-narrate that story of this is going to be hard, I'm going to struggle to do this, because the story you tell yourself is just as important to drive the outcome you want to see. Mm, absolutely, I, I love that. That should be, you know, on a big poster or billboard. Um, and I think as well, Dr. Lorato, I cannot ex share enough or encourage you know, the students and people attending tonight to please go and find Young MD. Um, if I can ask that you post all the details in the chat box to hear more around, you know, kind of thought leaders in this space. Um, I know through your series of, of podcasts is that you've covered some really difficult topics that haven't been discussed yet um, or before in a safe space. And this has really just um, really started those important conversations. And, and I cannot recommend to everyone, please go and and visit and listen um, and be inspired. Uh, so, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to invite Dr. Alicia Porter back. Um, I'd really love to, you know, now that we're wrapping up and I know that people need to leave and load shedding is not helping us, but I just wanted to come through to you. I know that you mentioned Dr. Porter in your, in your slides, a couple of tips and tools to look after, you know, our mental health uh, and really make that as a practice and a priority, especially during these difficult times, the push for the end of the year. What would be your top tips um, or even tips that have really worked for you to look after our mental health, especially as medical students, um, especially now, kind of your top five tips to, to cope? I mean, I think for me, it's about keeping it simple. Um, so it's about how to, how to manage and it's not a thing that we were taught, but I definitely think that stress is so much a part of, of medical school. I mean, we kind of walk around going, I'm stressed, 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 I'm stressed. You know, so it's about, let's begin to, you know, I think it was Lerato who said, you know, to begin to become aware. So, you know, for me, even now, um, it's about recognizing where I am on the stress graph and how can I kind of bring that stress into, into, you know, into equilibrium. The other thing about it is, you know, another um, tip I would say, and I think Lerato and Dr. Charlie also mentioned, it's about reaching out. Um, we belong to a community and just beginning to reach out and also just learning to ask for what it is that you need. And so asking for help. Um, is something that I think is it's difficult. It takes some courage to actually say I need help, but that's the first that's the first step in kind of breaking even the silence. Because I think a lot of us suffer in silence, and we kind of think I'm the only one experiencing X, Y, and Z. And when you find you know when you finally find the courage to have the conversation, you realize that you're sitting in a room full of people who may be experiencing um, the, same, the same thing. And I think just taking care of ourselves should be a priority. I know we take an oath that says we need to care for our patients and then, you know, patient first and then ourselves. But I think the pandemic has actually changed that completely. I remember at the beginning of a pan the pandemic, Prof. Amy's died at an ethics lecture and she said, the rules have now changed. It's 
take care of yourself first because you are the greatest resource within this pandemic. So take care of yourself first and that's how you'll be able to take care of your patients. And I think that self-care is more than just a trip to the spa, having your nails done, having a bubble bath. It really is challenging those narratives that we've had. You know, I hear lots of people and even for myself, you know, this idea that if I take a rest, then I must be lazy um, or I'm not working um, hard enough. And so it's about challenging these narratives that we've come with, because again, we can't compartmentalize, we come as whole people. So what are those narratives? And it's a very interesting, it's a very important thing that um, Lerato said, um, she said earlier in terms of, you know, that avoidance that, that um, we have. It's about examining what is this? Is this what is the emotion attached to this? Is it because I'm anxious? Is it because I fear failure? What is really happening, and why am I um, avoiding avoiding this? Um, you know, and so that for me would be how you know what I would say would be my top tips in terms of dealing with or coping. But it's about first beginning to understand yourself taking the time to know yourself and know what's happening um, for you. And I really think that just going forward, you know, they say in every generation, there's something that you need to be remembered for. And I do think that there is a mental health revolution of it, you know, a foot, um, as was mentioned, there is a little shift, but it's time to start having these hard conversations, these difficult um, conversations, so we can break the stigma and we can break the silence and begin to reach out when, when we need to. Oh, thank you so, so much. And I think um, it's such a great way to also just leave that as, as thought provoking and for us to all adopt and to practice. And, you know, Lorata, thank you for posting in the chat box those resources. And I've also posted the Healthcare Workers Care Network website there's some amazing videos on everything from dealing with stress to breathing to previous webinars that we've done um, over the last year and so. So please go use it as a resource, save it on your phone, have a look at it, um, explore the website and get those you know, resources accessible. I think just to, to end off the evening, um, you know, kind of your last messages of hope, of uh, you know, just inspiration and just ending on the importance of, of mental health and looking after themselves. Um, Dr. Claudia, I'll come to you first. Is What is your message to this group of students as we leave tonight and we've started this conversation? What do you hope that they take from this and, and is your, 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 your last comment? Thank you uh, for, for this opportunity. I just want to say, um, especially, uh, I know this platform is especially for the Nelson Mandela Fidel Castro students. I know it has been a tough journey to be where you are right now. And, and I think it is important, even though you might feel like you're okay, it is important to, to really reach out and, and, and address some of the things that you might've experienced in your prior training. Um, but on a lighter note for me, is to say that it is what it is, is not an excuse. It's not a, a, a substitution for therapy. Thank you. That's, that's really important. Um, Dr. Lorato, I know you're sitting in the dark there, but for your last words of wisdom, your, your last message for the students that have joined us tonight. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I think I echo um, what Dr. Tladi said. And I really first want to say just well done to every single student who's on this platform, well done. What you've done, how far you've come, why you're here means something. And the journey you're about to take to finish this degree means something. My hope for you is that you would never forget why you started and that that reason is always enough for you to continue. Yes, there will be challenges. Yes, you will have hard days, but don't be hard on yourself. There's always hope and the hope has to begin in you. I hope you recognize that this healthcare sector needs you. We need you desperately, not just to be the person who can do something at the bedside, but to come alive into who you are so that this healthcare system can start experiencing the change it needs. And that can't happen if you're not gonna pursue the fullest healing you have on the inside of you. All of us have work to do. Yes, we are healers, but there's a lot of healing we have to do in 
ourselves to be able to show up in the space as truthful and as authentic as what the space needs us to be. So my encouragement to you is just to never stop fighting to be the fullest version of yourself. Do not throw away your dream. Don't let the pressure of this healthcare system make you think that you've made the wrong decision. You've made the right choice. People need you back home. The people who you chose to do this for, even if it's just yourself or your family, they need you and it's a worthy cause to fight for. You've done absolutely well and we're proud of you and we are cheering you on. Wow, what a great way to to end. And I think that's exactly what it is. And I think this is the, you know, that that African proverb where it takes a village to raise a child, um, you know, that there is a village and a support now as well for you as medical students um, going forward. And, and just reading some of the comments as well um, in the chat box. Thank you so, so much for sharing. And I'm so grateful that this has been in some way moving or touching or thought provoking for you and you have more resources at your fingertips. Um, I think what would also be really, really great and you're welcome to use your Zoom reactions. Um, you're welcome to use emojis in the chat box. You know, if you have any ideas as well going forward um, of how we engage more, if you want more talks on different types of topics, you know, having more discussions, we wanna hear from you what would, what would help? What are you needing? Um, how can we engage further going forward? If you're keen to join a dedicated support group with you as a group of students, raise your, you know, <laughs> Zoom emotion thumbs up, give us an emoji in the chat box. Um, let us know how we can, you know, provide you support going forward, because it is really important. I see a couple of thumbs, so I'm encouraged. Um, but just yeah, to everyone who's sharing as well in the box, um, I'm really, really grateful. And to all the amazing speakers who have opened up, you know, our minds and opened up our hearts and shared such valuable tips, um, you know, only from their own journeys and insights and experience. Thank you so, so much for coming and sharing this evening and for your time, um, even in the dark and in the light. I really, really appreciate it. And to every single student who took the time after a busy day to come and connect. Um, and hold space for this important topic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate it and to everyone that's joined. Yeah, I hope we will share this recording and all the resources that we discussed in an email in the next day or so. So please look out for it. And if you need anything, we're welcome, you know, happy to stay behind and answer a couple of questions. I'll be here. Um, so if you need anything, just give us a shout. But to our speakers, have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everyone. Um, and we look forward to engaging more in the future. Have a wonderful evening. Good night.